Hey guys, how's it going? Today I'm going to tell you about my favorite ultralight cook kit and walk you through the alternatives I've tried along the way in order to explain why I ended up using the setup I currently am. And don't worry, I'll be sure to put an indexing link in the description below so that you can just skip to the end if you only want to hear the final result and not all the backstory explaining how I got there. Hi, I'm Dan and these videos are all about helping you to decrease the load you're carrying backpacking so that you can increase the joy you experience in the wilderness. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. It doesn't cost anything and that will help me to continue making these videos. If you find it useful, give it a like and most of all, thanks for watching. A few years ago, before I began transitioning to ultralight gear, probably like most of you, I was using the jet boil system. It's super fast, it's convenient because it all nests together in one package, and best of all, you can use it to make French press coffee. Man, I love that coffee, and I love my jet boil. In fact, I loved it so much, I bought a second one for my wife, and when I began counting ounces, I even invested in the titanium version. I really was hesitant to let go of this piece of gear. But I kept reading about how crazy light al alcohol stoves were, and once I had finished switching over the big three to ultralight versions, I knew the cook kit was the next area to play with to lose more pack weight. The traditional jet boil weighs 16 ounces, including the parts for coffee making, and the titanium version, which is called the Soul, is still 11 ounces. We usually don't count consumables like fuel, but the canister itself adds another four ounces to the total weight. One quick side tip, when you're storing the fuel canister inside the pot, if you put it in this way, the metal base is in contact with the bottom of the pot and it tends to form a ring of rust. So you're gonna to wanna to save that little plastic cap and put it in upside down and then you don't have to worry about that. Now there are tons of videos on YouTube teaching ways to make your own alcohol stove. I made this little guy which weighs just one, ounces, one ounce, but all you have to do is do a quick search how to make an alcohol stove and you'll see all the options. It doesn't have to be complicated. It can be as easy as using a paper punch to poke two rows of holes in a cat food can, which is great if you want to explore ultralight techniques without spending much money. This model worked just fine testing it in my shop, but before I had a chance to try it out in the woods, I discovered the Starlight stove and decided that would be better since it has a lid on it and this stove weighs with just half an ounce. One of the challenges of using alcohol stoves is knowing how much fuel will be needed each time. So my thinking was that with this lid, I could just cap it, save the extra for next time, and it wouldn't matter if I put too much alcohol in. In reality, that didn't actually work. Even capped and kept in a Ziploc baggie, the alcohol still just evaporated between breakfast and dinner, so that didn't seem to save anything. For the best efficiency, it doesn't work very well to just set the pot directly on the stove. You want the pot to rest about two inches above the stove where the flame is the hottest. In order to accomplish this, I fashioned this simple combination pot stand and windscreen by cutting about five inches off the end of a six inch diameter steel air duct, which is convenient because it has a joint that can be easily joined or disconnected, and then it can be rolled tighter to fit inside the pot. Then I drilled four holes for titanium tent stakes to use to support the pot at just the right height above the stove, which worked great. When I switched to using this type of stove, I expected that the biggest drawback would be the time it takes to boil water. Depending on the circumstances, alcohol stoves typically take between eight and 10 minutes to boil the standard two cups of water that you need for most meals versus two minutes for the jet boil. However, when it came time to make dinner, I learned to really enjoy the enforced time to just relax and soak in my surroundings. So the detail that I expected to be the biggest problem really didn't turn out to be an issue for me at all. I didn't mind that time. The second biggest drawback was a little more serious. That was losing the ability to make coffee. So I explored other methods using various screens to filter the grounds and then trying out lots of different freeze-dried coffees like Starbucks Via 
and others before ultimately, ultimately landing on this brand, Mount Hagen Coffee. I had just about despaired of finding one I liked, and coffee is such an individualistic taste that you might prefer something else, but for me, Mount Hagen solved that piece of the puzzle, and it comes in these one cup pouches, so it's just really easy and convenient. Using a different stove also meant having to change out the pot, so I switched to the Tokes 850 milliliter pot, which weighs three and a half ounces, and I learned that in the mornings it worked great for me to heat just a little more than two cups of water, dump just enough in the oatmeal to rehydrate that, and the rest was just right for my morning coffee using the pot as a mug. I also started repackaging the instant oatmeal into a Ziploc bag, and that meant not having to carry a bowl. Zero cleanup after meals, no food bits left in pristine mountain lakes, and no concerns about broadcasting coffee grounds. I also found that the whole kit nested in this pot just fine, so I do, didn't lose anything in compactness either. In fact, as you can see, it's considerably smaller than the jet boil. I used the alcohol stove set up for over a year, and it worked just fine for me. There were some things I didn't care for though, like never knowing for sure if I was using enough fuel and the mess involved. Funny thing about denatured alcohol, it has a different viscosity than water. Now, I'm no chemist, but I believe the molecules have tighter bonds. Basically, they're more sticky, which means it's virtually impossible to pour it without dribbling, and I didn't enjoy having alcohol on my hands and potentially even on my expensive high-tech gear. There are special containers to use that can minimize this problem. I just never got around to buying them. What convinced me to quit using the alcohol stove was two bad experiences that both happened on the same day. I was doing a section hike of the CDT from Rogers Pass to Helena in late May, and this one particular day I knew was going to be the hardest because of climbing two mountains that were likely to still have snow on the north sides. I wanted to get an early start, so I got up at four in the morning, but unfortunately, when I had hung the food bag the night before, I stashed the lighter in the cook kit in the food bag, and it rained during the night, the lighter got wet, and it wouldn't work. If that ever happens to you, by the way, the lighter will work again when it dries out. I just didn't have time to wait that morning. No problem, I figured. This is why I've been carrying that silly backup fire starter all these years. Now I finally have an excuse to use it. Well, I learned that morning that sparks from the flint wouldn't light the starlight stove. It needed a steady flame to take off. I could have gathered tinder and lit that to light the stove, but that would have taken lots of time, especially since everything was damp. So I just ate my breakfast cold rather than waste my early start. One silver lining of that experience was finding out that I could go without a hot breakfast and that I actually liked cold coffee both of which are things I do routinely and intentionally now, which you might already know about me if you've seen some of my trip videos. The second bad thing that happened was much more serious. After an exhausting day of post holing up to my knees and even my hips occasionally in spring snow, I finally got to a place where I could make dinner. Now, when you're that tired, that's when bad choices happen and I made a doozy. It was really breezy, so I was sitting on the ground, and I figured I would place the stove between my legs to shelter it from the wind while I was lighting it, and then quickly transfer it outside of my legs to do the actual cooking. I thought there would be plenty of time to do that before the metal heated up, but turns out it's instantly burning hot. So I lit the stove, picked it up over my left leg, and right when it got there, the pain registered that my fingers were burning, so naturally I dropped the stove right over my leg. Funny thing about alcohol, you can't see it burning in the daylight. So I'm staring at my leg, wondering if the fuel went out when I dropped the stove or if it's still burning, when all of a sudden I see my pants just disintegrate. They melted away and I was slapping at my leg and the ground trying to douse the flames that I couldn't even see. Well, I got it out, but the only thing that saved my leg from a bad burn was the fact that I had been wearing a neoprene sleeve over my knee since it had been such a strenuous day. The synthetic material of the pant leg melted to the knee brace instead of my skin. That close call was the fault of my own stupidity. It wasn't anything to do with the stove, but it did decide me to go back to a more conventional gas burner. 
I was tired of the mess, the fiddle factor, and most of all, the rare but real chance for serious problems, either an injury or possibly starting a larger fire. That was officially my worst day of backpacking. Yet, even on the worst day in the woods, you know, cool stuff can happen. Just before the incident with burning my pants off, this bull elk and a couple of cows wandered by the watering hole where I was making dinner. They were halfway down the hill to the water when they finally noticed me and decided maybe they weren't that thirsty after all. The switch back to a canister stove was easy to make. I just bought this small stove. This is the Snow Peak Light Max Titanium Burner. It's just two ounces. And I used that with the same Tokes pot. That worked great for over a year until I read a review of backpacking stoves on Backpacking Light. I'll link that below. And that mentioned that the Snow Peak was not very good with wind. I hadn't thought much about that before, but as soon as I read that, I recalled several instances when I did have troubles in that situation. So this year, I upgraded to the venerable MSR Pocket Rocket 2 at 2.5 ounces. This was highly rated, and these little fins that make an X across the burner help it to function well even with the breeze. You can see here how it compares to the Snow Peak. I got the version without the Petso igniter because I've never had one of those that lasted more than a season, which made my stove both cheaper and lighter. So this is my kit now, the Pocket Rocket 2 and the Tokes 850 milliliter pot, and that's it. What I like about this kit is that it's still very light, just six and a half ounces, including this little pouch that I use to protect the stove. But best of all, it's simple and robust. If I add in the four ounce weight of the empty fuel canister, the total weight is 10 and a half ounces. And it actually only takes about two and a half minutes to boil two cups, so really not much more time than the jet boil, but nine and a half ounces lighter. I haven't regretted for a moment switching back from an alcohol stove to this setup, and I've had no problems at all with it. Well, one minor issue, the bale on the pocket rocket isn't lined up with the off position, so when I flipped that over and connect it to the fuel canister, some gas was escaping until I figured out that I just have to flip it over and turn it off prior to attaching. As long as I remember that, no problem. And I don't know, maybe this is just uh, unique to this individual unit that wasn't quite lined up right. Okay, so that's my favorite cook kit. If you found this useful, please give it a like. And just a reminder that this video is the first one talking about changing the group of gear known as the second big three. Next time, we'll talk about the clothing system. So don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell notification so you don't miss that episode. Thanks for watching and take care.